טוב חברים, ברוכים הבאים לקבוצת ג'נסיס, נוסר חופש ומשפחה, הערב אנחנו מארחים את לוידי יונג והוא ידבר איתנו על הנושא החשוב והסבוך של גנוסטיקה. לוידי, תודה רבה לכם שאתם מתכוונים לכם, זה תמיד תמיד פלאשר, ואת הסטייג' היא שלכם, בבקשה. תודה רבה שאתם מתכוונים לכם שוב. האם יש לכם שאלות לפני שאנחנו מתכוונים? אין שאלות? I have questions, but uh, I thought we should, you know, oh, while you uh, present the facts, then we can speak about it. Okay, yeah, so I have 76 slides. I'm not going to do every single one. I'm going to try and give a good overview, and we'll see where the questions go. Um, so let me do just an introduction. So nonsense, I've got, the, I've called this nonsense thecism. You saw the opening slide, I called it Nostianity. Because the Gnostics, while there was an element of what we'd call quote-unquote Jewish Gnosticism, in the first century it took on a slightly different dimension and it started to absorb and adapt, camouflage itself using Christian ideas, Christian words. And it is very confusing and very complex. It is not, obviously, it's not honest. It doesn't present itself honestly. It's a parasite, as Jordan Peterson would explain it. It is very confusing. It is completely irrational. It, re it is ahistorical. It rejects history. It wants to go with what it feels is right. It is incredibly feelings-based. And you can, you can probably see as we go how this sort of underscores the, the woke movement with woke thinking as opposed to thinking that is grounded in rationality and logic. So it is more than a reaction to Christianity. Gnosticism is anti-Christian. In fact, it is anti-biblical and most explicitly anti-Jewish. Now, what I've got here, just so we know this picture in the background that you see here, here you've got Thoth, the Egyptian god. And there's at least half a dozen different stories about him that, and this story has changed throughout history. So the stories are, are kind of, people like to tell the, tell the narrative that, you know, he starts at roughly as a, as a contemporary of Moses. He brings wisdom, he becomes a god or, He's adopted as a god or he was a god, whatever. There's a whole bunch of different stories. But when you look at the narrative throughout history, it is, it's a riot of contradictory and completely self-serving stories, which serves the group who's telling the story at the time. However, this here in the middle is Hermes Trismegistus. Now, he and the Gnostics seem to have a common link. They share certain things in common. Then at a certain point, there's a split. So within Islam, oddly enough, Hermes Trismegistus and Hermes is... integral to a numerous to numerous occult groups like say Madame Blavatsky and others they all claim lineage and they all claim possession of the secret knowledge given by Hermes Trismegistus or the thrice great Hermes now when the Greeks eventually took over Egypt they merged Hermes with Thoth here on this guy and um, this is Mercury so he's also the Roman Mercury says so Hermes Trismegistus Thoth and Mercury And oddly enough, the Muslims took him as well. So the Muslims took this, this pagan god, this pagan god of wisdom. And in the Islamic Hikama, he's the source of the Hikama. So this guy that is, has inspired people like Aleister Crowley and others and, and other pagan and Gnostic and occult groups, he becomes Idris in the Quran. So he's actually now a forefather of, of Islam and a forefather of Muhammad, which is insane. So it's the product of Egyptian, Hermetic, and Platonic thought with roots going back nearly 1,200 years before Christ, or at least so they claim. Some go back as far back as like 1,800 BC. So we want to do a gentle introduction, all right? And now Islamic law defines Islam as a Gnostic religion, and I've mentioned this before, and I'll just quickly go through this. So this is the Reliance of the Traveler, and I have shown this before. I'm just going to show one or two simple examples here. Okay, so if we go through the reliance of the traveler, and we can see here that in this most popular, most famous book of Islamic law, they speak of how the Islamic scholars are Gnostics, and how you should not stop at the first traces of Gnosis and think you've achieved all knowledge and you must continue. And they speak here of others have claimed to attain to Gnosis and contemplative knowledge of the divine, right? To have passed through blah, blah, blah. But they didn't, no, because we Muslims... We have attained to Gnosis. You can see the Arabic on the right-hand side here. 
So the Muslims claim that they are the true Gnostics, that they are the true inheritors of the wisdom of Hermes Trismegistus, of the Egyptian god Thoth, which is insanity. Right? Gnosticism is the oldest enemy of the church and it's an enemy of reason that inspired innumerable heresies throughout history. And it is very much widespread in the church today. And in fact, Martin Luther and Calvin seems to have seem to have revived a number of old heresies, especially Manichaean or Manichaeism. So they revived the heresy of Mani and brought back some of those ideas and implemented it within the Protestant thinking that they well the Protestant theology that they developed. So also if you've yes. What would be the characteristics that can be found in Luther, Lutheranism and Calvinism that you can uh, attribute to Gnosticism? I have extensive notes on that, which I want to edit into a presentation, which I haven't finished yet, but I've read it extensively. But for instance, there's, you know that there was the whole idea of, okay, so you had the Jewish Bible, which has X number of books, and then you had eventually the New Testament, you've got the apostles, and they and eventually they write a number of epistles, a number of other things that become the New Testament. Now, Martin Luther comes along and he decides he's getting rid of a few books from the Bible because, of course, he believes in Scripture alone, except first we've got to edit the Scripture, you know, slice and dice to make it look and feel the way I want, and then it's Scripture alone, right? And one of the claims he makes, and this very same claim that Calvin makes, is they refer to that they received the inner testimony of the Spirit, or the secret testimony of the Spirit, which gave them the inner knowledge, the secret knowledge of which books had to be taken out of the Bible. And they knew this not through knowledge, not through information, not with not with evidence, not with proofs, but they just knew, they just had a secret knowledge because the wisdom spoke to them privately. And therefore, trust me, bro, I'm hearing the voices. As one example, this is how they chose the Protestant canon versus the Catholic canon of scripture thank you right i will discuss some of this we will go into some of this as we go but i, I want to kind of leave that so i can give a thorough answer once i've got all the other research together but there's there's certainly too many elements to ignore so gnosticism talks about secret knowledge or a gnosis right now in philosophy gnosticism means there's a dialect a dialectic now when we speak of aristotelian logic a dialectic is a process of logic that you use to discover something, to discover the truth. However, Gnostics will co-opt the language, so they will copy the vocabulary, but not your dictionary. They mean words in a completely different way. So now, when you speak of a dialectic in the Gnostic terms or in the Marxist terms, because Marx was a Gnostic as well, they speak of a dialectic of or a strife between opposites, because the Gnostics believe in, in a dualistic universe where there's a conflict between light and dark. Right? So a strife between opposites or contraries that eventuates in the need for secret knowledge or gnosis to overcome the, the contradiction. So they don't do non-contradictory logic. They happily embrace contradictions and it's completely irrational. And it's obviously the opposite of Arist Aristotelian logic. So they believe that all of these elements that are in strife are part of a larger pantheistic whole. So it still has the, these elements of a, of a pantheistic religion. So the universe is seen as a unity of opposites, and these opposites are not really opposed to each other, but a complementary part of a larger whole. So in other words, you know, it's not white and it's not black, it's shades of gray, and there's no real evil, you know, there's no real good. It's just it's just how you look at it, it's just how you understand it. And this really is just relativism. It's just relativism dressed up in fancy words. Right? So they reverse evil, evil becomes good, and very often good becomes evil, but now they'll say one thing, but they, what they tell you is not necessarily how they act, or how they respond to the information, how they act upon the information, so they will contradict themselves constantly, so evil becomes good, it's just misunderstood, there is no evil, understand, this is how they can moralize to themselves when, the, when evil happens, now of course, there is no evil, Evil is just good. It's just misunderstood good. There's no such thing as evil. It's just perspective, except Christianity is evil. The Jews are evil. See, the created world is evil. Everything is evil. The West is evil. America is evil. Um, being heterosexual is evil. Does that make sense? Of course. Uh, we see that every, in, in, every day in today's world, especially yeah, so with the walk movement. 
Right, it's completely irrational. So these are very different views. Now, it's a religious view at the end of the day. So they're very different views of God, of Jesus, salvation, and scripture. Now, I don't know that much about the Sethian Gnostics from the Jewish perspective, but the ideas should generally carry through in terms of these how these groups think. It's how they think that's important. Right, so you've got a collection of ancient pseudo-biblical religious myths that taught that the material world, the created world, is evil and that only a special knowledge of the divine can redeem the human spirit. So salvation is not through God. Salvation is not through practicing good works, right? Salvation is through knowledge. The only evil, the only sin is ignorance. And they believe that they found the secret knowledge that allows them to leave this shell of a body that they exist, this evil shell, and commune with God directly, that they are God. And we'll discuss more. So Gnostics regard the God of Israel and the Father of Jesus as different beings, with the former being a lower and ignorant creator. So Yahweh becomes an ignorant creator. In fact, it's much worse than that. He becomes effectively Satan. Christianity is based on the teaching of Jesus of Naz Nazareth, right? So you've got, he becomes the son of God, he's the supreme being. Now, Christianity affirms that the God of Israel and the Father of Jesus are one and the same, right? And that the Old Te Testament, the New Testament, are the Word of God. Gnostics claim to be the only true believers because they have the secret revelation. It's a private revelation, right? So Gnostics believe that salvation comes through spiritual enlightenment because matter is evil. Matter cannot be trusted. Your brain is evil. Your brain is part of matter. Therefore, you have to disassociate from your brain and you have to use the secret knowledge. And the secret knowledge is the inner testimony of the spirit. So, so this is the destruction of reason. Correct. Yes, correct. It is a com it's a complete violation of the rules of thought, the laws of thought, yes. So, for instance, you've got all these Gnostic texts that were in these fake Gnostic Gospels, right? The first apocalypse of James, the, the, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Peter, etc., etc., because they were always named after well-known apostles. So they wrote all of these fake gospels and there were huge theological debates and huge confusion across the Christian world because people couldn't tell whether this was Gnostic or whether it was authentically from the Christian church, right? So they claim that Jesus taught that the world was a prison created by an evil God. This world is guarded by evil archons who require a secret password, right? So Paul in the New Testament warns Timothy about Gnosticism. So he says, Timothy, guard what is committed to your trust. That is the, the traditions of your fathers that was handed down to you, or the traditions from God that were handed down to you. Avoid the profane and the idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge or gnosis by professing this gnosis. And in some translations, they'll use the word science, right? By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. That's in 1 Timothy. The book of John is effectively said to be a complete repudiation of Gnosticism. It was written specifically to oppose Gnostic thinking. So already within the Bible, within the very first century, you've got you've got these apostles that are warning against Gnostic thought. The Gnostics were present and active in the first century already. So it's a religion for elites. It is an elite religion designed to be intentionally complex, intentionally hard to understand, just like Marxism. This separates their followers from those who don't understand. Now, Islam is multiple levels with the knowledge elites at the top. Islam meets this criteria as well. If you cannot understand Gnostic teaching, it's because only those who are inducted into the mysteries can understand its secrets. And that's why Muslims will tell you, well, you have to read it in Arabic. You have to be an imam. You have to be one of the religious elite. Now, in Islam, you've got the ulama, right? Singular is alim. The term denotes scholars of almost all disciplines, although referring more specifically to the scholars of the religious sciences or the sciences so-called, because these do not adhere to, to the Western view of science. Science is a methodology to determine fact, determine truth, to measure things. But these are not, these are religious. This is just theological science. These are speculations, right? In Sunni Islam, the ulama are regarded as the guardians, the transmitters and interpreters of religious knowledge the theological elite of Islamic doctrine and law, embracing those who fulfill religious functions in the community that require a certain level of expertise in religious and judicial issues. 
the alim, the alim is often seen as opposed to the adab, here of profane knowledge. So you understand, they're phrasing it very politely, but now you're talking about the religious elite, those who know the truth. You are just here to listen to them and do what they tell you, and don't worry your head too much about it, because these guys have secret knowledge. Just like you have, and the same thinking, you'll find it like in the World Economic Forum, and groups like that who know better than you, because they are the elite. They have the knowledge. Right? Now, it is often presented as the version of Christianity that lost in the race of rival Christianities. You'll find various scholars like Bart Ehrman will make this claim. But this is based on a very, very specious understanding. It's, it's irrational, in fact, because um, let's take well, what is a fundamental tenet of Judaism. You've got Yahweh, the creator God. Okay, Yahweh is, he made the world. And then you have the satanic, the opposer, let's say. Um, so... And then you have Moses, right? And can we can we have, for instance, that that Yahweh is that Yahweh is also Satan? That Yahweh also causes evil, right? Would you say that Yahweh is the source of all that is good? Yahweh is the source of all that is moral, the source of the law. But Yahweh is also the devil. He also performs evil. He pushes us to do evil. He takes responsibility. Would that be rational? Would that be logical? if these contradictories were somehow the same. Would that make sense? No, it's either you're good or bad. You can't be both. So, exactly. Whereas for them, so what they've got is when they, when they say that, that this Gnosticism is the inversion, the opposite of the Jewish belief, it is the opposite of the Christian belief, right? It contradicts and violates those two beliefs. Now, somehow these scholars are claiming that that these contradictory and opposed beliefs are equalities and that, you know, they because they're stretching the limits of doctrine far beyond what that doctrine allows because the doctrine has very narrow, for instance, is pedophilia okay or is pedophilia not okay, right? And they'll say, well, these guys were pedophiles, these guys were not, but, you know, it's all the same thing because that that's okay because, you see, these Christians committed pedophilia with kiddies these Christians can, don't commit pedophilia. They, they, they think it's terrible and they'll give you the death penalty if you do that. But they all, they're both Christians. No, they, they're opposites. These are contradictories. And, and so they're stretching the doctrine to say, well, it includes both and they're equal. And it's complete nonsense. The ulama refers to the scholars of the religious sciences, right? And we learn here, oops, a general tendency was to be observed among practitioners of the, of the religious scientists to consider a certain knowledge only what is inherited from the Prophet Muhammad. They're not speaking here of science, science as we know it. This is certain knowledge. This is the gnosis that they're referring to here. The religious sciences in Islam, as I showed you briefly in their Sharia manual, that is the gnosis. And they say here within, for Ibn Taymiyyah, and this is within the, within the Encyclopedia of Islam, the gold standard reference, the science par excellence is that which derives from the Prophet. All the rest is either useless or does not deserve to be called science. So that which Muhammad brought. Now remember, we just mentioned earlier Hermes Trismegistus and Thoth, right? This, this pagan Egyptian god who came from the Egyptian mystery schools. And the information that he brought is what Muhammad brought, the original Gnosis. And this guy is supposed to be the one who brought the Hikmah, the knowledge to Islam, and he's the ancestor of Muhammad. So now you've got Muhammad has brought the secret knowledge and only that is knowledge. Everything else is, which is why you have a backwards Islam, because all other knowledge is considered to be secondary. And they speak of numerous prophetic traditions on the study of science, which concern only religious knowledge. Now, I think everybody knows my views of Islam. It's a bullshit idea. So, but the science in Islam is, is Islamic thinking and Islamic thinking is trash. Any thoughts before I go on? No, we experience uh, Islam every day, so uh, we are very familiar with uh, this trash. You, you should go on, please. And this is the science. You see, they're practicing the science on you. The ulama have long been seen as a distinct group, a regulated and structured body, expressing the popular voice, constituting the solid framework, and get this, permanent government behind the changing dynasties. So the ulama are said to be the solid framework of permanent government behind the changing dynasties. So these guys are, well, you translate that for me. What does that tell you? 
they are the puppet masters behind. They are pulling the strings. That's exactly what... who is in control uh, to the profane. There is some <clears throat> superior um, people who have the secret knowledge who play the game and we just move according to the tunes. So they're the ones in the background pulling the strings. So now I'm going to go to... So this is Al-Ghazali, right? The most, most famous Muslim scholar after Muhammad himself. The most authoritative. This is called the Niche for Lights, the Mishkat Al-Anwar. And we're going to have a look at this translation. So this guy is the most, he's like the the, the 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 saint. He's like the most important scholar. They call him the Hujjat al-Islam, the proof of Islam. And they speak here of, so he's speaking here of the ulama, right? The scholars, the Sufis in this case. The Sufis are the ulama effectively. And they say here, right? The experience con contains much that is obscure and too difficult for most minds. Now, if we had to go through the Sharia manual that I mentioned earlier, the Reliance, they will speak of how only the scholars can understand this and the lay people, it's just too much for their brains to absorb. But he says that the perfect Illuminati, and here he's calling this ulama, these Muslim scholars, the perfect Illuminati. Uh, your thoughts on that before I go on? Um, I, 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 I would like to ask a question which is related to that. I understand from other scholars that uh, in the beginning they accepted uh, because they had access to the writings of Aristo and other Greek philosophers and mm -hmm. it was woven into Islam and then in the 8th or 9th century and especially with Al-Ghazali they eventually went against these Hellenistic influences of reason and eventually they became irreasonable and and mystical uh, right can you speak to that a little i can uh, it's been a while since i've looked at that but briefly speaking uh what is important is they thought they had aristotle they didn't what they had was neoplatonic paraphrases or neoplatonic reinterpretations of aristotle by a neoplatonist so for hundreds of years they thought they had the original manuscripts of aristotle but they did not they had neoplatonic texts which they were presenting and thinking was aristotle but these were actually effectively Gnostic texts by, um, by Plotinus and his followers. So they only discovered centuries later that they were actually reading something that wasn't Aristotle and was closer related to the, to the Gnostic views of Plotinus. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so basically they never rejected reason, Aristot Aristotelian reason. They just Good. never had full access to that. And they never had it. That's why Al-Ghazali... Yeah, I understand. Wow. So they killed, effectively, they killed off the people that, that they opposed with the thinking that they opposed. Yeah, they just they killed off the other group, the, Mutaz the Mutazilites. They pretty much just wiped them out. But also, the perfect Illuminati. We've all heard of the Illuminati, but everyone goes, the Jews are the Illuminati. Everyone knows that. And they eat children on Fridays. Whereas these Muslims, the scholar that translated this calls them bluntly the Illuminati. Now remember, we've spoken before when I did my previous talks on how they claim to have started the Freemasons, that they claim to be the original founders of the Freemasonic groups and that they are the ones with the true secret knowledge. They are the ones with the true information. Does that make sense now? Yes. Uh, what, what were the circumstances uh, that supported uh, Muhammad to have access to this kind of Gnostic ideas? Is it because uh, all the Gnostic people in, in the area that was under control of the Roman Empire escaped when it was taken by Christianity? Yeah. And they so, yeah, so in Arabian the third century, so the biggest threat to Christianity in the third century was from possibly the cult of Isis. There were other groups, but the cult of Isis was a huge religious um, op op opposition in the third or fourth century and eventually when um, when christianity was made legal these groups fled now there are three places where these guys went one was haran in turkey just over the syrian border uh, this is where abraham actually comes from right this is where abraham and his father Terah come from so that was one of the main sources and that's where they rediscovered a lot of the secret knowledge and in the ninth century the sufis took that knowledge when they conquered that region to spain and that's how it infiltrated Europe. Then you've also got Alexandria, a lot of Gnostics, a lot of these heresies come out of Alexandria in Egypt. That's also where the library was. And the third place is Najran, just across the Yemeni border, Southern Arabia, in uh, South in Saudi Arabia, just, just above the border of Yemen, very in the very south. 
this was a Christian pilgrimage site, but there were huge theological battles because I think the only the book of Matthew was available at the time in the third and fourth centuries. And what happened is the Gnostics were writing fake gospels like crazy. So people were incredibly confused and a lot of heresies. In fact, at one point, the Romans called that part of the region um, um, Arabia Heresium Ferax or Arabia, the bearer of heresies, because there was so much heresy in that region. So they fled Rome uh, and went there. Yeah. Just one a little question about the Sufis. Uh, the people, for example, in the Al-Azhar University in Cairo, are, are they Sufis? Yes. Oh, so, okay. So Al-Azhar University has, they, they have the four standard Sunni sects, right? But they also recognize the Jafari school of the Shia because they believe that Sufism is where the, the two schools, where the two, the two groups, the Shia and the Sunni, where they actually bridge, where they merge, where they find common ground through Sufism. So you've got the so you've got the four groups of the Sunnis, right? Um, the Maliki, the the Hanafi, the Hanbali, and um, and I can't remember the fourth one for whatever reason now. But also, Al Ashar also teaches seven schools of Sufism. Few people know this that they teach the seven main tariqas of Sufism, and the head of the guy who runs Al Ashar is himself a Sufi. Lots of Muslims, a lot of people want to say Sufis are not Muslims, but this is untrue. Why would a Sufi be running the school, be running Al-Azhar, if they're not Muslims? And the guy before him is also a Sufi. So that should tell us something. Does it have to do with the fact that uh, Egypt was uh, basically Shia in the 12th century under the Fatimids? Yeah, the Shia are more probably of overtly, or more overtly magical and occultic because there's a lot of the occult in Islam. But um, very possibly, very possibly, um, but the, the Sunnis do it as well, but they just, shall we say, more quiet about it. They're just less obvious and open about these leanings. Actually, maybe I should try and find something here. Um, let me try and find a resource. Um, Okay, so have a look at this. So, so since we're talking about this, and this is bearing on Gnosticism and occultism, because it's always bound up at some point with magic, ritual magic, occultism. This is the word harf. The plural is huruf, akhruf. Now, they'll speak very commonly in Islam about the different readings of the Quran, the different interpretations, the akhruf. They'll say there's seven of them, or 10 of them, or 14, or just pick your number, three, I don't know, 13.65, uh, whatever. Now, it translates as word. It also translates as a Quranic reading or a dialect. Now, those are true, but what's odd is that in the Encyclopedia of Islam, when it's convenient, they normally a dictionary will have the primary meaning listed first and secondary and tertiary meanings later. For some reason, they have these very short, very basic meanings on top. And then at the bottom, at number 14, they stick this. The science, the ilm al khuruf Notice, onomatomancy, a magical practice based on the occult properties of the letters of the alphabet and of the divine and angelic names which they form, which is a Gnostic practice, to know the names of the spirits so you can control them and you can then enter deeper into paradise and further from the material world. Your thoughts on that before I go on? I, I once met a Freemason uh, and he actually spoke in, in similar terms about uh, some magical practice that they are going to have. It's, it's interesting because you made the claim, and I think you proved it, that the Sufis and Islam uh, as agnostic faith is basically the origins of the Freemasons. So, same things. Yeah, I'm going to go to volume 3, page 595b. So, I'm actually going to go to that. Um, so, we can see what this is about. Okay, so let's go have a look. 595b, so we just... Okay, so this is what they were referring to here. So, so you notice that there's some of the overlap with you said with the Freemasonry, right? So look here, huruf, ilm, the science of letters, onomatomancy, in the strict sense, a magical practice. They gave it the name of semiya, which is usually reserved for white magic, but elsewhere they'll tell you white magic is good, black magic is bad, but semiya is white magic, is black magic, they're the same thing. 
they will contradict themselves constantly. So you'll just come across suddenly like it says something completely different than it did two sentences ago. And notice it is based on the occult properties of the alphabet. And they speak of erythmomancy or gematria. So Islam has its own version of this as well, right? And it is based on alchemy because, of course, the term alchemy comes from Islam as well. So, And in fact, alchemy comes from Hermistrius Magistus, right? This idea of the transformation of lead into gold. But really, that is symbolic of the transformation of man into the perfect man, transformation of the soul. It's really not an alchemical transformation. It's a spiritual transformation to become the perfect man. Once you merge your consciousness with God, you attain the God consciousness. And the 28 letters of the Arabic alphabet are divided into four categories, each of the seven letters conforming to the four basic elements, fire, air, water, earth. Yeah, fire, water, fire letters, water. And then, of course, you also have lunar and solar letters. Now you're getting into the whole animistic, pagan, and um, the astronomical sort of deities. And then huruf, combining the letters so as to obtain a whole possessing particular properties and an esoteric character is attached. So let's go down here and see a bit more. And they speak of astrological and theurgical factors. Theurgical means the summoning of demons, summoning of spirits. You see? And to understand the mystery of numbers is to penetrate the divine intelligence. To understand the mystery of the huruf is to penetrate that of the Holy Spirit. So the Quran has these, what they call these, these missing letters or these unscrambled letters, unknown letters, like like Alif, Lim, Mam, and, and words like that, that no one knows what they mean. Like they are in the Quran and they, no one knows what they mean, but they are supposed to be rituals. In rituals, you, you do these incantations using these words. And because they have no meaning or no obvious meaning that's known to us, you disassociate from your rational mind and you go into a, into a trance where you exit your body, you exit your mind, what they call a pre-rational or post-rational state. And you then can go through the veils and enter into the throne room of Allah and you can merge your soul finally with Allah. Because the Gnostics believe matter was made, matter, matter is evil, the world was made by an evil God, and the evil God attacked the good God and shards of the good God's essence fell into the world and is trapped in our bodies and therefore we all have to die. You have to kill all the babies so you don't complete, so you don't keep on diluting. The, that's why you have to reduce the world population to half a million so that you can... You know, you can start to consolidate the, the 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 shards of the good God soul into as few people as possible, so we can all die off and send it back to heaven, so that we, we can reconstitute the good God, because that's why we're all gods, because our soul is actually a fragment of the good God that the bad God injured, and then he can take over the bad God and take destroy him and bring peace back to the world. Does that make sense? It's insanity the, what you just described. Um, I, I have a practical question, if I may. Eventually, they created yes. all this uh, system of irrational thought. And uh, yep. eventually, what is the purpose of all that? Is, is that just to maintain control over those who are not initiated into this nonsense? Like to, to create an aristocratic uh, a group of people? No, they look, I mean, access? if you're a psychopath, look, if you lose all of your morality, you become effectively a psychopath, right? You have no compassion. You have no care for other people. So they are psychopaths, right? But they have this, this occult. What happens is no, no one has no beliefs. They, they want to end the world. It's a, it's a death cult. It's a death affirming cult. Like, you know, look at Hamas and those things. They, they say, we love death. They are a death cult. They believe that they will earn reward. They will earn paradise for killing and being killed. It's, it's, it's messed up. It's completely messed up. They, they have to end the world. Right? They have to look at the Georgia Guidestone story, half a million people on the world or half a billion or whatever it was, and um, eat the bugs because they know what they'll do. It'll kill you off. And this, they are serving God. They're serving their idea of God. They are reconstituting the world and they are moving closer to God by killing other people. There was a point that I, I think that they changed their strategies from uh, something which is more uh, sacred, theological, to a secular version of that. I think it can be found in the mil millenarians um, and eventually in Marxis the Marxist and... It's uh, all Hegel Gnostic. Philosophy. All of it's Gnostic. All of it's Gnostic. Hegel was, uh, Hegel was um, hermetic, basically following that ideas. But the thing is this. This is not like, look, when you're using, when you're using the laws of non-contradictory logic, Aristotelian thinking, 
you have very clear guidelines on most things as to black and white. One plus one is two. When you're a Gnostic, one plus one could be equal to egg. One plus one is equal to round. One plus one could be, understand, there is no clear, it's whatever you feel, whatever is right, whatever serves your purpose. There, there, is, there is no logic that is controlling these outcomes. Do you understand? There's no definition. That's why they redefine words. So they have an objection and they can manipulate the content to further the objection. This is, um, I, I actually, I'll give you an example, actually. I'll show you an example. I actually have this. So, for instance, just so quickly, these sciences were practiced by the greatest spirits of humanity, such as Hermes. And in Islam, it's Idris. This is the Encyclopedia of Islam. Don't forget, right? This is an Idris, the Muslim figure. So this pagan god, right? And Islam is anything but pagan, is Idris, the second prophet mentioned in the Quran, right? And they've even been attributed to Aristotle two works. But of course, we know that that wasn't Aristotle. These guys thought that Aristotle and they had some Neoplatonic fool that was doing this. Right. So does that help to clarify some of this stuff? Of course. Very clear to me. Okay. So this is Rudolf Bultmann here, this twit. Uh, he was one of the most influential scholars of the 20th century, 19th century, right? Religious scholars. But of course, he's a Lutheran. So he's influenced by Martin Luther, the Gnostic, right? So now the... The early church fathers obviously criticized this thinking as completely irrational. And it never died out though. Okay. So what happens is you've got the text. Now, for instance, you've got Rudolf Bultmann saying the text of the Mandeans, the Cathars or the Albigenses, right? These were major, seriously crazy heretics. I mean, insane religious freaks from the 9th, 10th, 11th, 11th or 12th century. Yeah. Have been used by scholars like Rudolf Bultmann to support the thesis of a pre-Christian Gnostianity, right? He calls it a pre-Christian Gnosticism, and which influenced the New Testament. So he's saying, look, these Gnostics came before the Christians. Now, there's another scholar um, called, I can't remember the name, but um, there's a common thesis, the Bauer, Rudolf, a guy called Bauer, the Bauer thesis that many people push. And the thing is, the odd thing is that they quote second century and third century sources to claim that these sources come before the first century sources that make up Christian belief which is weird that they're using second century sources and not any first century sources, but yet still claiming these are older thoughts and that the first century ideas come after the second century ideas, which is completely backwards and stupid. So that's why you can say anything you like because they're irrational, right? And he was a German Lutheran theologian and this guy was now obviously anti-Christian. And um, now, the Mandeans could not have originated before the second century. So he's claiming that Christianity is based on the Mandeans. The Mandeans still exist today. They are Gnostics as well, openly Gnostic, right? And also you've got ancient Mesopotamian elements which have been retained in their magic and rites. And a lot of that stuff is also in Islam. People don't realize this magic and is also in Islam, right? So there's this idea that the, that the, the, the Catholic Church killed everyone or beat everyone up. And uh, also what's interesting, uh, you had the Gospels of the New Testament, like those discovered at Nag Hammadi, are attributed to Jesus' followers. Okay, But now Nag Hammadi is where they found all of the Gnostic Gospels. But Nag or Naj, I always forget the word. I, I good grief, the Arabic word. What does the Arabic word Naj or Nag mean? Nag is just the Egyptian pronunciation. Naj means like, sorry? But now do you know? We speak, We have a, a, an Arabic speaker here. Yeah. Manal? No, sorry. Okay, so Naj means it's something like, I'm probably going to get it wrong, but it's something like exalted or important or righteous, something in that, in that context, in that line, right? So Naj Hamadi is where they found all of the Gnostic Gospels, all the fake Gospels. Hamadi is a contraction of Muhammad. So the Naj of Muhammad which is really weird. That is such an odd choice of name. This is and the place that, that they found in Egypt in 1940-something? Yep, all the Gnostic Gospels were found there at the Naj of Muhammad. How, how convenient that they found it. Yeah, oh, isn't it odd? Like so Muhammad might have been a Gnostic. But, but the thing is, if you go through my series Munotheism, then Muhammad turns out to be a Sabi who's a Sabaean who is from Turkey, from Haran. And the Sabaeans are... Gnostics are pagan Gnostics. Okay. So also you got scholars who claim that the Christian idea of Satan led to demonization and persecution of others because Christians falsely invented evil. 
you see? And when they created evil, they you just used it to demonize people they didn't like. See? Okay, I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this stuff. Just to give you some idea of the Gnostic eons, this is Valentinus. He's a well-known Gnostic from the 2nd or 3rd century. And this is his god, Ealdabaoth. Now, also, the Templars started using this symbol, okay, on some of their... Um, on some of their their uh, insignia and such, the Templars, so which means that they had started adopting the Gnostic beliefs because of too much time in the Middle East as well. They came into contact with this. Yeah. What is the importance of the snake that is eating his own tail? Uh, that's the Ouroboros. That that's the the cycle of birth and rebirth. Um, it depends on who you're going to ask, I guess. But that's that the world is always um, you know cycle of birth and rebirth. Uh, there might be other depending on which culture they might have different ideas. It's, it's is it similar to the uh, concept of as above, so below, in a way? Probably, yes. Yes, that, that will be true, correct? There'll be different representations of that, as above, so below. That is also true. But also notice that the snake in within the Christian doctrine, if you look at the Old Testament, the snake goes to Adam and Eve and says, um, you know, hey, actually, God's been misleading you. Have an apple, and uh, you guys will be sorted out, right? You guys will be smarter and better looking. And, of course, he leads them. That's Satan who leads them into sin. Now, in the Gnostic story, Satan is the good guy. So it's the inverse of, of both Christian and Jewish morality. They, they, they take Satan and they turn Satan into God and they turn God into Satan. So they speak of the Ogdoad, the Eight, the Decad, the Ten, and the Duodecad, the Twelve, which make up the Pleroma, which is the fullness in their nonsense cosmology. And you have Sophia, the wisdom. Now, Sophia is in Islam called the Leilat, right? The Leilat, it's a long story. You've got to make a bunch of associations, but... So you've got um, the Lataif, which is, which is a state of subtleties where you start to see subtleties which can only be discerned by those who are of sainthood or prophethood, by the greatest of Muslim imams. They, they can see this, right? And that's the Lataif, the, the third highest level in Islam that you can achieve spiritually. But then the Lataif is also connected to the Latifa, and Latifa is, also can be connected to what they call the Laylat, and the Leilat is the equivalent of the Sophia. She is the she is this this goddess or whatever. She's this spirit, this eon that creates Yahweh. She creates the bad god, the evil god, the dark god, the god with no light. And the dark evil god, thinking he's the only god, creates the world that we live in today. Right? For God made the world and the world was good, right? Genesis. But he the world that was made was evil, right? And now, Leilat, what does that sound like? Anyone wants to take a guess? Leilat? Lilith, from the Bible. Lilith, exactly. So, in other words, their Sophia is Lilith. And who is Lilith? A demon that ate babies. She defied God. Do you understand? She defied God. Yeah? What was the process in which Sophia separated herself from the Pleroma to create Yaldabaoth? There's a story there, so hold on. Let me let me actually just run through this. Uh Yadabaoth is the son or the child or descendant of chaos. He's not of the he's not of the uh, Pleroma. So hold on, let me just That's basically the Demiurge. Uh, yeah, he is the Demiurge, yeah. Yeah, let me quickly do Carl Jung and then I'm gonna find let me find that reference for you. Hold on. Actually, let me find this reference that I need to do Carl Jung, that's page 17. Um but let me find. Um, it's actually so. I've got to find a particular. Okay. What's wrong with that the song? Twinkle, twinkle. Uh, I'll get to. Okay, fine. I'll just. You know what? I'll just jump around. We'll, okay, <laughs> let me let, let me do a couple of things. I'll do that next. Okay. So first of all, so Carl Jung. Okay, Carl Jung is a Gnostic freak. People don't realize. So. Okay, Gnosticism and alchemy was for Carl, for Carl Jung, the, pre, the chief prefiguration of his analytical psychology. This guy was fucking crazy, to put it mildly. Okay, so he wrote here the Gnostic Jung, including ser seven sermons to the dead, right? He was a Gnostic. He was a crazy man, and we regard him as a great thinker, right? The search for the roots. Okay, search for roots, C.G. Jung and the traditions of Gnosis, right? These are books about his Gnosticism. Jung did not simply interpret Gnostic texts psychologically, but also cited them as confirmation of his psychology. So this crazy Gnosticism was confirmation of Jung's Gnostic psychology. So the guy was 
way out of left field. An authority on theories of myth and Gnosticism, Robert Siegel has searched the Jungian corpus to bring together in one volume Jung's main discussion of his ancient form of spirituality, included in both Jung's soul work devoted entirely to Gnosticism, Gnostic symbols of the self, and his own Gnostic myth, Seven Sermons to the Dead. So he saw Gnosticism as a precursor to his understanding of the collective unconscious. You see, because we all belong to the one God that was damaged by the evil God. And once, so we are all gods because we have a sliver of God within us. See, so we're not individual souls. We are just, we are pieces of God and we need to get, we all need to die, get out of our bodies. And only the, only our thoughts, only what we think is real, because that is, that's, that spirit light talking, but the body is, the matter is evil. And then we need to connect and we'll all be one happy pleuron, one happy monad up in the, up in heaven. Okay. So this was a precursor to his understanding of the collective unconscious. Okay. And so let's have a quick look here. So for Gnostics in the beginning, you have a God of pure light. Okay. I'll call him Albert. Okay. The monad. Albert is not a creator. He's just a mindless emanator. He just emanates things. He has no personality. He's not like Yahweh. He's got a personality, right? The monad creates more gods. These are called eons. And these eons have less light than Albert. They are inferior I beings. Think, yeah? I think Albert was basically the mind. And his first, first thought was the uh, Bilabao. Uh, not uh, the Yaldabaoth. Uh, an end. No, no. Um, oh. There was before Yaldabaoth and before the creation of the eons, Albert created um, uh, the Barabao, something like that. Oh, the Barbalo. No. Yeah, yes, yes. No, the Barbalo Gnostics, yes. that's a particular group. Like, there's hundreds of these groups and they all have contradictory, utterly crazy ideas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Albert is so funny. <laughs> yeah. So, so Albert, so the Moneg, so Albert creates gods called eons and they've got less light than him. Then these eons create more gods that have less light. And this cascade continues until a god is created that has almost no light and is almost pure evil. And this god is the demiurge. A grief term, term that means the, the craftsman, a maker god in other words, and what you call Yahweh, the god of the Bible. And this is based on the platonic notion of forms or ideas. See, so so now his name, we know it's Albert, but court, the records are unclear. His name, name would also be Cecil. So just so you know. Okay, I'm going to skip over this, and then you asked me, what was that about? What was it? Uh, twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Okay, so let's go to Twinkle, Little Star. Let me, let me get ahead of myself here. Okay, so what you have to do is, okay, you have to, there are seven elements. Look, these are not, there are seven rough elements you can, you can find that are common to Gnosticism. So I'm going to go here to, okay, so let us take, let us start here with principle number seven. Okay, syncretism, where they take stuff and they smash them together and they take contradictory ideas, widget. Basically, syncretism is take thesis, take antithesis, you get synthesis. That's syncretism. Take, take stuff, take water, smash it together, you get soup. Right? So, so Gnosticism has a Hegelian yeah? dialect. Correct. Correct. The Hegelian dialectic. It's all hermetic Gnostic. So Gnosticism has an ability. Let me start. Let me do a couple of pages to give you this idea. So Gnosticism has this unique ability to appropriate or steal the writings of other religions and incorporate them. Religious trappings and symbols are assimilated. These people are the Borg in a big way, right? So they incorporate these ideas into the nonsense mythological system. So they've adapted baptism, the Eucharist, and worship services from Christianity, from other religions. So the reason it can do this is because of what they call the allegorical hermeneutic. And here we have, this is important. So hermeneutic is the theory and practice of interpretation. How do we interpret something? And this involves understanding and uncovering of meaning within text, symbols, and cultural phenomena. As Jews, hopefully you'll be familiar with that because you've got what I think they call the Peshat within the Jewish practice. When you read the Torah, you, you interpret it in different ways, the, the literal reading, there's like the allegorical reading, there's the there's the symbolic reading, and you get different meanings out of the text. Now, some scholars have used the term symbiosis rather than syncretism, but symbiosis can be utterly parasitic, and these people are parasitic. All right, so now let's have a look at the allegorical hermeneutic applied to Mary had a little lamb. So much of the success of Gnosticism, because that's what Gnosticism also is, it's the love and worship of your own mind, of pride, of your own ideas, regardless of outside evidence. 
it depended on this allegorical hermeneutic, and this we have to. So in the exegesis on the soul, the writer takes portions of the Bible dealing with adultery, like Hosea 2, 2, 7, and Ezekiel 16, 23 to 26, and he interprets the woman of the passage as a metaphor for the soul, speaking not just of the prostitution of the body, but especially the soul. So now within this, you get an interpretation of certain things that when we do evil, we affect our soul, not just it's not just a physical act. Now, there's difficulty understanding the Gnostics because we have their writings, but we don't understand how they interpreted those writings, right? How did they read their text? So to give you an understanding of how they would read a text and how they would take something that means one thing and have it mean something completely different. I mean, just breaking your brain in the process. Mary had a little lamb. So let's have a look at how they do this. Allegory is poetry or myth. It's a story you make up. It's a narrative you invent. So the expression by means of symbolic, fictional figures and actions of truths or generalizations of human existence. So you make up a fiction using symbolic fi figment of your imagination to explain things, right? It's a story, a play, a poem. So in other words, it's disassociated from fact. It's disassociated from reason, from science. It's not grounded in history. It is mythology, completely mythology. It's nonsense. A play, a poem, a picture, or another work in which the characters and events represent qualities or ideas that relate to morals, religion, or politics. That's in the Cambridge Dictionary. A story or poem or picture which can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, typically a moral or political one. So everything is interpreted. Allegory or allegory, a story whose moral is represented symbolically. And the Platonic myth, Plato again, narrative stories and allegories used to convey philosophical ideas and concepts in a symbolic and metaphorical manner. And in the Christian idea, within the Bible, you have parables, a short, simple story that illustrates a lesson. But let's have a look at Mary. Mary had a little lamb as allegory. Mary had a little lamb is an English language nursery rhyme from 19th century America, first published by American writer Sarah Josepha Hale in 1830. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. He followed her to school one day that was against the rule. It made the children laugh and play to see a lamb at school. Okay, so before we go on, do you see anything spiritual, anything deep, anything to do with anything in that except what it says? Anything nefarious or weird about that? The only that? problem that I recognized was that it was against the rule. Which rule? But you can't take a lamb to school. No animals at school. But which school? What is this? I, I guess are you a Gnostic? Are you being a Gnostic? Thing. Are you being difficult now? So and, 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 and it's it, it's a lamb, right? Ah, the lamb, uh, right? It's Jesus. Yes, it's it's a lamb. <laughs> you see, do you understand how easy it is to play the Gnostic game? So Gnostic success is derived from its method of interpretation. So you might think this famous poem is about a little girl whose pet lamb follows her to school, but you're wrong. If you were inducted into the mysteries, you would see that Mary is a teacher of Gnosis. The lamb is her student, and the fleece is the garment of bad thinking that was washed clean white because the student came to understand the deep Gnostic mysteries. The student then becomes so attracted to Gnostic teachings that the student dares to enter the school, the temple of learning for the initiate to become one of the elite, one of the elite of Gnosticism. And this is against the rules and cultural norms. But those inducted into nonsense realize that the true Gnostic is above the rules and laws of the material world. We are not bound by these rules. And the other children, they laugh. They don't understand. They don't understand. But you, as a true Gnostic, you know what you are doing. And the world can laugh. But you, you have found the truth. So reality is reinterpreted to make a fantasy and contradictions are inverted because facts don't matter. Does that make sense? So the, it's incredible. They are basically creating a secondary reality and they can make whatever interpretations they want and dismiss yep. the first reality, which is based on reason and evidence. Yes. It's all fantasy. It's make-believe. It's a view of the world. It's oh, a way of seeing the world. It's an interpretation of reality. It's a false interpretation of reality. Yeah. All the time you ask, you ask if it's it's make if it makes sense, and I'm like, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's irrational, but you can understand it's messed up logic. So the other Gnostics, the children who laugh and play, rejoice at the initiation of a new elite member. 
Now notice, I said earlier that these guys are laughing at you because they think you're being ridiculous, but meanwhile, you know, you have the secret knowledge and they are the ignorant ones, they don't know, but here they've got exactly the opposite interpretation and it's also 100% correct, which violates basic Aristotelian logic because these are contradictories, they cannot both be correct. Do you understand how Gnosticism has no respect for logic? Uh, you cannot have contradictive uh, characteristic of something, and in the same time, it will be uh, how to say uh, reasonable. A is A; it cannot be A and B in the same time. That's Correct. Fine. So Mary has a little lamb. We just presented this as a Gnostic allegory, as a way of interpretation. So this is how Gnosticism adapts to any religious context. It takes anything, twists it, and makes it its own. You see, so. Basically, you've got this figurative allegories which inverts the intended meaning of anything. It turns everything upside down. It is therefore satanic. It makes good evil. It makes evil good. It is the opposer of the God of the Bible. It is the opposer of objective truth, of objective good. Does that, do you understand that? Definitely. It is yeah, therefore definitely. satanic. Right? So the Nag Hammadi Library is the largest collection of Gnostic writings, right? So the Pauline epistles and the church fathers all tell us what early Christians believed. Now, Nag Hammadi doesn't have epistles. They didn't write their beliefs in explicit doctrinal language. Why? Because it's secret knowledge. See, it's secret. They can't tell you. So they wrote down these things, but we don't know how they understood them. The secret knowledge was not written down to keep it secret. It's oral, right? So they usurp the symbols, they steal and they borrow and absorb the symbols and writings of any faith by redefining them to become compatible with and subordinate to the Gnostics' own beliefs. You see how dangerous this, philo this philosophy is? Right, now twinkle, twinkle, yeah. little star. Yeah, go on, please. Uh, possible to ask a question? Sure, please go ahead, yeah. There is, uh, do you have uh, um, an example of the Judaism, like um, how they can twist? He means the infiltration of Gnostic ideas into Judaism. Look, I have, okay, so here's the thing. I, I mean, I'm not looking to annoy people, but I, I tend to say, tell people what I think. I have looked at, at the ideas of the rabbis. I've looked into some of that. So Gnosticism first was found now, look, I mean, we've got a source in Egypt, right? The, these, these stupid Egyptian mystery schools and blah, blah, blah. And then Gnosticism is like, it's like it, it shares some things in common with Hermeticism, but it has some things in contrast, right? But it seems to have a common root there, right? So that seems to be where its origin is. So they, they are, they're both equally messed up ways of interpreting the world. But it would seem to my mind, what I've seen is that the rabbis, and this is not to say every rabbi, every group of rabbis, but a certain group, to a certain degree at some time adopted both pagan ideas and Gnostic ideas. Now, this happened in Islam. Islam started off as a pagan religion and it adopted Gnostic ideas to clothe itself like in pseudo-biblical language and pseudo-biblical, I don't know, pretense. But from what I've seen, what I think is that the, the, the rabbis somehow absorbed Zoroastrianism as well as Gnostic ideas, as well as these ideas of Hermeticism incorporated them. You saw the earlier the, the the earth letters, the fire letters, the water letters and, and the and the gematria and all that stuff. That they got from the pagan Arabs and that was absorbed into Judaism because they violate, to my knowledge, the laws of Deuteronomy or Leviticus. Thanks to Deuteronomy, they violate those laws. They should not be how, part how of the Judaic corpus. Sorry? Yeah. Lo, lo, so, sorry, uh, Lloyd. How, sure. how how where are we in the timestamp like in, in history? In how 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 far can we um, um, see or understand that they touched the Judaism? Um, I think it's, look, to my mind at least, I think it's fairly, we can go back, because the early Gnostics, I have a different presentation on, on very early Gnostic beliefs from the first century. And they all, the, the Sethian Gnostics, before, before they were Christian Gnostics, right? The, the, there's, an, there's an overlap between Old Testament Gnostics and New Testament Gnostics, right? If you want to look at it that way. And they all incorporate these Jewish mysteries. They all incorporate these Jewish ideas that are from some very obscure Jewish books that only the Jewish scholars would know. So it would seem that if you go back 2,000 years, roughly the first century, the early parts, I would say 
definitely there's evidence from the last decade of the first century to the first decade of the second century. So between 90, 95 and 115 AD that you can find evidence of this, this whole Jewish slash Christian overlap, this, this beginning to happen where they've taken these ideas and and then I've seen other things that, that, to my mind, show me that the that many of the rabbis have absorbed Zoroastrian and Gnostic ideas, which should not be present within the the Judaic religion. Uh, but then, then again, these are not Levitical priests, right? This is now old. This is now after the fall of the temple. Now you've got these Pharisees that come in, and they've got some weird ass ideas. The, Hopefully, that does. Specific, yeah? uh, a specific plans uh, uh, to, to to show us. Um, no, I mean, I haven't, I've got, I've looked at a whole bunch of notes. I actually never got around to actually formal, formally putting it together, but I have looked at it in the past. And that was to my mind, what I came, what, what, what I decided, what I concluded based on what I'd seen. And I, at some point I do want to put it together and actually go, you know, here's the evidence for what, for what I think this is where Gnosticism and, and paganism infiltrated into the, the rabbinical thinking. So right now we don't have a concrete uh, evidence that it is exist uh, right now i mean there's there's plenty like the thing is look what i do is i have software that goes through things and indexes things that allows me to find connections i can feed it thousands of books thousands of references thousands of documents and then find common elements between them so in other words people used to read one book at a time find a fact and then go you know now i can do this in seconds right it still doesn't take me five minutes it still takes me months sometimes but I can I can I can index twenty five thousand books in in one two seconds, right? Mm -hmm. And then I can okay. find common themes and join the dots and see that there's correlation all across these things, right? So, I mean, this is this is now look for instance, there's definitely I would there is definitely Gnosticism in the thinking of Martin Luther and John Calvin. The Protestant religion definitely has Gnostic elements. Sorry. I'm, I'm asking that yeah. because of the technology that we have today, you know, with an AI software, you can do it in a moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, before 10 or 20 years ago, you, you couldn't do it just like this. You could, now you could uh, program every, every, every text in the universe. And the yeah, it's not that uh, easy. I use these tools. Believe me, I pay for them. I, I pay, I pay, I pay hundreds of dollars a year right now on, on software. And I've been using software for years before AI even was a thing. I've been using indexing software. I have massive databases of data. I've got gigabytes and gigabytes, thousands of books. But you still, you've got to be careful with these AIs. I mean, I've worked with technology my whole life. You have to be careful how you ask the questions, what you wanted to look for. It misses things, it has gaps. It really helps a lot. It is very helpful, but it doesn't replace you. It, you've got to be so careful. You've got to phrase the questions correctly. You've got to interpret them correctly. You've got to feed them back in. You've got to learn. Every AI has its own quirks. And sometimes when you join an instance, they feed you with a different personality of the AI. Maybe they're testing it or whatever, but not every connection that you have with that AI is the same. So I don't know what it, but yeah, you've got to be, yes, it's very helpful. You can do in minutes what would have taken a year. True. But it can also send you on a wild goose chase or just lie to you. So be careful. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hopefully that answers. Did I hopefully I gave you at least something of an answer. Is that okay? Oh, perfect. Thank you. Maybe. So at one point I will put together where I think there's a Gnostic influence within the rabbinical beliefs. By the same token, I, there's definitely an infiltration into the Protestant religious beliefs. So it's this kind of weird merging of Gnostic beliefs and Christian beliefs. It's kind of an odd mixture of the two. It's not pure. If, if you know, in that sense, it's definitely, well, it's not first century Christian belief. Let's put it that way. So twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. And here's the Gnostic allegorical method. The star represents the divine spark within every individual, symbolizing the, div the divine essence or the hidden divine knowledge that lies within each soul. The seeker represented by the narrator wonders about the nature and purpose of this inner divine spark up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. The phrase up above the world so high signifies the transcendence of the material world and the limitations of physical existence. Is that getting boring already? Does that make sense how you can take anything and turn it into a pile of nonsense? Yes, Is that yes, clear? Yes, it's yes, very yes. interesting. Yes. Let's continue. Yes. I love it. Yes, of course. If there is, there is no logic, you can do whatever. 
it's all mythical. It's all poetry. Understand? It's all myth yeah, and poetry. Yeah. So the blazing sun, when the blazing sun is gone, when he nothing shines upon, so the blazing sun represents the false light of the material world, which is temporary and illusory. It symbolizes the deceptive. Do you notice that these descriptions are not in the text? They are making this up. This is called eisegesis. You are reading your own nonsense, your own imagination. This is your the voices talking to you and telling you that's what's in there. And that's why these people can't agree. That's why two of them read the same text and have 50 different interpretations. And they'll make it up as they go. That's how men can have babies today. Does that make sense? Yeah. So so let me go. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> okay, so let me go find... Yeah. When, when <clears throat> I mean, this kind this of, kind uh, of uh, baby, baby song, song that you just uh, um, shared with us is something very common, very common to every family, every family. And, they and they don't, don't have, have a deep understanding, understanding of the mystic interpretation. interpretation. It's like a profane, profane understanding. understanding. So, so why is why it that they are sharing, sharing those songs, songs with us? What, what is, what uh, is the benefit, benefit for them? them? Are, are they are like, like having, having a laugh? A laugh? <laughs> um, hold on. Um... Yeah, the Gnostics just just want you to to absorb their mind. You see, to become crazy like them. Hold on, I'm trying to find something here. Um, okay, so I don't know if you guys know this is this is not the reference I wanted. I have one somewhere. I just can't remember where I put it. Okay, but Carl Jung had a guy called Philemon. Uh, okay, hold on. Carl Jung had a secret friend. Carl Jung had an imaginary friend a spirit that would visit him, a spirit called Philemon that would come and have long conversations with him. He would go for walks and have talks with Philemon. Philemon would tell him the secrets of the universe. Philemon would tell him the secrets of man's soul and man's mind. And Philemon would, would explain things to Jung. In other words, Jung was talking to an imaginary being. And he was getting secret knowledge from an imaginary being called Philemon. Let me see if it's in so, here. So, yeah? so did Muhammad. Momo. Yes, yes, isn't that odd? <laughs> let, let me actually try and find the reference to Philemon. Let me just try and find it. Um, let me actually find it for you so that I can show you that, that this guy was off his nut and we consider him and we consider him one of the greatest minds of the world. Ah, his, here we his go. His teacher, uh, Freud, was, was a serious uh, problem as well. Yeah, that guy, actually I have... So yeah, I've actually so there's a yeah, sick man fraud. Two psychologists. Carl Jung and a guy called Sick Man Fraud. You may have heard of him. <laughs> yes. Sick man. Oh, so yeah. this is here. Actually I've got something here on Jung and Sick Man Fraud, but um so um so Jung has this he was an arrogant, belligerent, and intensely selfish man who who destroyed several people's lives pursuing selfish ambitions. His ideas were heavily influenced by popular German folkish cults. These are the cults that influenced the Nazis, don't forget. It is from discussions with Philemon, Jung's spirit guide, that Jung received his most profound insights. In other words, the voices told him, man. The voices told him. Yeah, so Freud was also messed up. But Philemon was simply a superior knowledge. Superior knowledge, you got that? And he taught me psychological objectivity. And the actuality of the soul, he formulated and expressed everything which I had never thought. Philemon represented a force which was not myself. In my fantasies, I held conversations with him and he said things which I had not consciously thought. For I observed clearly that it was he who spoke and not me. This guy is messed up. Psychologically, Philemon represented superior insight. He was a mysterious figure. He seemed to be quite real, as if he were a living personality. I went walking up and down the garden with him. And to me, he was what the Indians call a guru, Carl Jung. This is very similar to other New Age ideas. For example, the ones they are pushing in uh, Theosophia. And you can actually uh, find a similar, um, like Philemon, in Blavatsky's writings. Uh, yep. the, the pyramid of up, higher knowledge coming from down from Tibet or whatever nonsense they, they present. Yep. So, so let's have a quick look at this. So what do you notice about this picture here? What can you, what do you see here? As above, Met, so below. Meta, meta humanism. Yeah, notice you've got the ding dong and the boobies. Yeah. Yes. 
you see you've got the ding dong and the boobies and you've got the satanic and you've got the moon and the star as well anyone know of a religion that uses a moon and a star islam yeah now notice the twisted snakes you've got the twisted snakes because the snake is god don't forget the snake is god Remind me, please, uh, what's the connection between the snakes and God? Uh, because the good Lucifer, God, the snake, uh, uh, Lucifer, yeah, he, Adam and Eve. One rescuing Adam and Eve from the, God, from the garden jail, he, right? From correct. He rescued Adam and Eve, exactly. You understand? He was, he's the true God that saved them from Satan. You see? The inversion. Yeah. Right? So let's have a look at this. But, but, but Lloyd, but please yep. do explain. Um, you and Harry controlled the knowledge better. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, so look, uh, Philemon, can you come over and just help me explain to this gentleman? Uh, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so in Plato's philosophy, right? Okay. Now in, let's skip all that. Let's skip all that. So craftsman. So remember the demiurge is a craftsman deity. It's a, it's a maker God and craft craftsman deities or maker deities are part of the Egyptian religious milieu. For example, Canum created mankind on a potter's wheel out of clay. So that would explain the whole idea of the maker god, the demiurge, who made the world, right? Who made matter, right? As each of the god is created, sparks fly off, and the sparks of light become angels. Angels are eons. Sparks of darkness become demons. Now we've got a whole different story. Understand? They make it up as they go. Right. Yep. You know, the craftsman's creator is Geppetto in Pinocchio's story. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. It's agnostic story, and the, the Freemasons are learning it. And, and breaking wow. it down to to make the interpretations that can connect to the ideas that you're presenting before us. I, I saw it in a in a web website of uh, Freemasons in Israel, and they have that um, um, wow. how do you call it Docu documentation uh, available for everyone to understand the 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 secret knowledge in in Pinocchio's story. And the, so, and the man who wrote Pinocchio is a Freemason, 33 degree. Okay, so, but couldn't that also be just how they take this allegorical hom um, hermeneutic and apply it to this story and boom, suddenly you have secret knowledge, you understand? They, they could apply it to anything, your washing machine manual, how to operate your kettle. <laughs> yeah, but in this case, the author himself, the Italian author, was a Freemason, so... Okay, no, fair, that's, of course I didn't know that. So, actually, hold on, let me just zoom into this picture here. I just want to show you this, for instance. People go, well, you know, Gnostics are not Hermetics, and Hermetics are not Gnostics! Well, look at this here, okay? So, Ignis Hereticum, Luciferian Gnosis, right? Um, so, you've got this Luciferian, so they, here they call the Gnosis evil, as above, so below. Notice, they, they openly make these associations, right? Um, the weakest sparks become trapped in the most corrupt bodies, which is those of women. Uh, I've got some references I was thinking, but it wasn't that. There's some references I have to the, the overlap between Gnosticism and, uh, and Hermeticism, how they actually overlap. Now, of course, what you've got here. Um, oh, so the weakest sparks become trapped in the most corrupt bodies. And the most corrupt bodies are women. The most corrupt bodies are women because women have babies. You see, women create more life and they dilute the life force even more with babies. That's why we need abortions, because we need to have fewer babies, because then we can start to consolidate the trapped parts of can the... Can you, yeah? can you connect this important point to how uh, in Islam women how to be perceived? Yeah, well, women are the greatest number of souls in hell. Women are the majority of hell. Women are that's the lowest... The Quran, right? Yeah, that, that's women are the lowest of the low. Women are the, the ones in hell. Right? So notice in this, you've got transcending dualities, realizing God and Satan are the same entity, you. See? This just dissolved morality right there. Right? Now, have a look here. The cosmic whirlpool. Okay? You need to choose Albert. Corrupt female bodies left the non well, the, the nostrums with the problem of how women can be saved because women are the most corrupt. Below the earth is a whirlpool with souls that are too wretched or too lost to become women or who die without the help of the Gnostics are tossed into, particularly in the teachings of Valentinus. You see? So Muhammad said, I looked into the hellfire. The majority of its dwellers were women. And that's... Now, for the Muslims who are later going to come along, who can't understand a joke and who don't know their own sources, it says here, Da'if Bukhari, 
Just so, by the way, there is no such thing as Daif Bukhari. This is called a joke. It's Sahih Bukhari. Sound, you know, this is like the highest grade of Hadith, the most sound grade of all. It's, I'm calling it Daif because Muslims will always turn around and say, that's Daif. Whenever you say something embarrassing, they'll they'll say that the, the most sound Hadiths are suddenly Daif or the weakest, the least reliable. So that's why I just call them Daif. But just so you guys know, Muslims, that's called a joke and you're stupid. Okay, moving on. Hopefully you guys got that as well. I was just having a conversation with future people. Yeah, I got it. So, yeah. Thank you. and they speak here of the, you know, the spiritual station of annihilation in Gnostic vision, you see, and stopping, and you've seen all of this, okay, that people claim they've reached near to Allah, they, and so on, and we have attained to Gnosis, the Gnostic, and the Gnostic's spiritual will exalted above all else. This is in the Sharia. The Sharia speaks of this, has reached the level of those to whom the unseen is disclosed and have Gnostic insight. So you see, that's why women have such a low status in Islam, because women are the lowest of the Gnostics. The men are the true Gnostics. The door of Gnosis, they must pass through this knowledge, and the sea of Gnostic inspiration called the Mukashafa, right? The tenets of faith are comprehended through the Gnosis, you can see. And yeah, go on. And now I'm going to do this I other... Would like to, no? I would like to emphasize the point that I learned from you. You're basically saying that Gnosticism is a cult of death. Now, yeah. women, uh, um, you know, they, they bring life and then they dilute the, the monad, right? The, the yes. life of the of, of monad. So, so basically because they bring life, they are in a position to the secret knowledge that will unite you back with God because you put those lights uh, which are part of the big god into this uh, jail uh, evil place and the evil bodies so yep. the woman yeah. the women are creating I, evil I, bodies I, yeah sorry yeah i i could i can see it very it's like simpler they're they are creating life so are they are against death and they are the cult of death fair so, point yeah yeah fair point fair point yeah so <laughs> Yeah. Some of those cult groups, uh, Gnostic groups, did they commit uh, suicide on mass? Um, they may well have done so. I mean, you know, there's been some some death cults throughout history. Like um, the I forgot, just forgot the name, but there've been groups that have done so that have killed themselves. Uh, the and one then, that comes to my mind is the people in Johnstown and with John Jones, for example. And I know and I for a fact that, that they were yeah. like promoting socialism. And when they died I, on the recording of the death yeah. recording. Yeah, they, actually they actually said that they are going to sacrifice themselves as activists for the sake of socialism. And uh, obviously we can connect Gnosticism and socialism very easily. If you do Marx, if you study Marx, and I've got it in my other slides on Marx and socialism and atheism, Marx sold his soul to Satan. He says it. Marx was a Satanist. Now he's, a, he's, an, he's an atheist socialist who sold his soul to Satan and he's serving Satan. I shit you not. Yeah. Where do I find uh, the sources for that? Um, you send me five dollars, and then I will send you secret knowledge through Carrier Pigeon, because that's the only safe way to do this. <laughs> I don't want. I will speak with my imaginary friend Pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I'm Jew. I can't pay. <laughs> Let's go. On. Oh my God! You. Oh, I'm so disappointed now. Okay, so this is something you asked about. Gnostics, male-female distinction is a corruption. Within the Bible, male-female distinction is God's good design, what the Catholics call the Imago Dei. So in Genesis 1 verse 27, God says, In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. So God made men and women as different and interdependent. They are equal, but not the same. Each sex has its own distinct role to play in God's design for family, society, and church. What is one of the main, look, you know that Marxism has also 10 commandments, right? There are 10 commandments of Marxism. One of those is the destruction of the family, which is exactly the opposite of God's design, right? Now, within the Gnostic distinction, male-female is a corruption. What are we learning from the transgenders today? There's no such thing as male and female. The distinction between men and women should be rejected because it is part of the useless creation order of the physical order. The ideal is androgyny, a synthesis of male and female, and so neither one nor the other. The outworking of this Baphomet. ranges, Baphomet, exactly, okay, chicks with dicks. The outworking of this ranges from, 
<laughs> Sorry. The outworking of this ranges from goddess worship to saying women need to become men to be saved. But the common theme is seeing the male-female distinction as defective, part of the fallen world of death. We must escape it if we are to find true life. So in the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, it says, when you make the male and the female one and the same, so that the male not be male, nor the female female, then you will enter the kingdom. Simon Peter said to him, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I shall make, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. And that is in verse number 114 of the gospel the gospel of thomas the gnostic gospel of thomas what do fem wow. what do what do feminazis want men be, well women to be like men right yes it's entirely gnostic does that make sense guys wow it's huge yes to me at least feminism is a product of communism which is a product of gnosticism which is a product of this bullshit first century second century thinking you understand that all of this stuff is just, it's all anti-Christian. It's all, look, I mean, you guys are Jews, so it's all, and let's just say it's all pseudo-biblical, anti-biblical. It's all against Yahweh. At the end of the day, it's all against the Jewish slash Christian view of God. I mean, the difference is, of course, that the rabbis generally hate Christianity and don't believe God's a trinity, although the Zohar says something else, but that's a long story again. But but you understand that, that this is all anti-biblical. But you can take it a step further for those who are not, you know, too much into religion. And you can basically say that they are against the logos, against reason, against Fully. everything that yes. can, objective reality even. And, and uh, epistemology, I, I, it's, we cannot even know anything because everything is upside down with them. Correct. It's, yes. It's pos it's, it will be correct to say that they are just against life. Yes, correct. Marx was dead set against life. Marx was, was in Marx was atheism. Look. To offend the atheists out there, you should watch my talks on atheism, especially the one on Darwinism. I've got about five talks on atheism in depth, the history of atheism that atheists don't want you to know. But when you look at the history of atheism as a modern phenomenon from the 1750s, 1780s onwards, atheism is a cult of death, atheist ideology, atheist practice, the things atheists have done, the things atheists have been behind politically. It is... It is horrific and frightening. And once you study, once you study Darwin, Darwin was, Darwin loved death. Darwin wanted death. He brought death. Death to him brought life. Death brought perfection. Darwin inspired so much murder. It is shocking once you understand the, 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 the implications here. Result-wise, it can be measured by numbers on how many people yeah. died under atheistic regimes. Yeah. No, it's shocking. And those were Darwinian regimes as well. And 91% of atheists identify as Darwinists. And once you study oh, Darwin, Darwin was a psychopath. 9% identify supposedly, but effectively it eventually merges into the same thing. But but Darwin was a psychopath. Darwin used to take his little geological hammer. Darwin was supposed to be a scientist. He loved, you know, people don't realize, but Darwin loved murdering small animals. He would throw rocks. He would throw bricks. He would throw stones at small animals and murder them. He would he would kill birds with his bare hands, right? He would throw, so he'd murder rabbits and he beat a puppy one day with a hammer, I think. He beat a puppy with a hammer and he said that, um, and just to, just to see what happened, just to see what would happen. He would kill small animals, right? Um, he, he used to lie. He writes in his diary, he was a consummate liar as a child. He would constantly tell lies as a child. And when he went on his little journey around the world, he took his hammer. And according to the captain, Darwin used to delight in murdering every animal he could see. He would run around on these islands like the Galapagos, where there'd be tens of thousands of animals. And he said he bashed in the heads of thousands of birds for the fun of it. When you read these stories, it is blood curdling. You realize this man was sick, utterly sick in the head. And that's not, when it comes to Darwin, they tell you, butterflies, Dar Darwin collected butterflies. Not that Darwin shot mutilated, stepped on, wrung the neck of, beat through rocks at, and used his hammer to crush the skulls of thousands and thousands of animals. 
I'm I'm thinking as you're speaking, and I'm like, if they got inside every uh, religion, and we we even speak um, in the group that the the like the state and the governments are uh, a religion, and would it be far fetched to say that? Um, the, and I will I will say it as I think the <laughs> university has just one uh, run one uh, um, um, reason to exist, and it's to promote one um, thing that is death through poetry, through science, and I I I say in times that. It's a science. It's the the science of death. It's, ah yes, uh, yeah. Actually, and, fig and well, like, well, well, well spotted, yeah. Yeah, because if if I'm thinking, I was I was a, a fraud investigator, and I'm I'm thinking like backwards. I'm thinking, okay, if I would do it, like if I would want to trap someone in a in a trap that he can see, I will teach him the trap so he can be it, so he can be the trap. So I will teach him science, and I will teach him poetry, and I will I will I will even teach him all the religions. But I will control the knowledge. I will control the papers. I will control everything, and he will believe that it's the the true thing. Well, look, I mean, if you've watched anything by um, Yuri Bezmenov, then you'll understand that that these people have been making these plans for for decades, if not centuries. But at least for decades, and they've been busy implementing this in the world. So this is true. You see it. I mean, men, men can have babies now, right? And there's no distinction Actually, between men and women, which is which is why that that President Trump was the first female president in 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 America. Actually, it's very interesting that you mentioned Yuri Bazmanov because he went uh, as part of his uh, KGB role to India. India to learn about uh, the gurus there and the new age that was basically infecting the minds of the people who came from the US and Europe. And mm -hmm. this is part of how you, um, how do you call it, the four stages of how you break the society from, from within. And, and the only thing that will fight against it, to be quite honest, what I've seen is if you go back to good thinking, you need to apply non-contradictory logic. You need to have very strong morals. These people have no objective morality. They've got no objective truth, and they are destruct. It's the destruction of reason, as you discussed in the beginning. Notice also they for in this group, by the way, this is the, the purpose of the group. Yeah, morality and unfortunately, and, 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 yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, and unfortunately, religion. Once you go back to 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 proper religion, I mean, the, that's now another debate, but. You need to get morals from, I would say, you've got to go back to God on this one. And I, and I say this in all seriousness, because that is, that is the root of moral law and the root of the logos. Whereas you're dealing with irrationality and immorality, evil, the satanic. So, but onto this point, forbidding to marry, right? Remember the decline of the West. Oh my God, we're not having kiddies. What are we going to do? Oh, we need to import all of Africa into Israel. Oh my God, we're not having babies here in Europe and America. What are we going to do? Oh, let's just import the Middle East and Africa. Well, how about you just have babies, right? Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Why? Because it makes you less healthy, right? So commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. And of course, this leads us to vegetarianism, which is another religion, which is Gnostic, Right? So, so the Old Testament about that a little more, please, if you have more knowledge about veganism and how it serves this. Uh, because the, min, min, many of them were Gnostics. They look. I can't remember all of it. I got it through. It's in various of my talks. Like I can't remember every single fan. I'd have to look it up. But but basically, they okay. So one of the reasons. This is not the only reason, but one of the reasons is you turn your back on the world. Okay, so. You have ascetics, right? Ascetics turn their back on the world. They don't want to get involved with the world. They go live in a cave or whatever. They wear just one pair of underpants and a wool sack for the rest of their lives. They don't participate in the world. They refuse to be involved. They just sit in the corner and go, um, okay? That's your, that's your, West, that's your Eastern gurus, right? 
because they are thumbing their nose at God. They're rejecting the world because the world is evil. Only the spirit is good. Only what the mind is good, right? Well, your thoughts are good, right? But you must separate from your mind because your mind is still matter and therefore you need to find the secret mind, right? The feelings, the fifis, right? You have to separate. So that's where that whole ascetic movement comes from. You are denying yourself the world. You are separating from the world. You are rejecting the world. The world is evil. Then you get the hedonists. They go shag everything that moves. They live vicariously. They do whatever the hell they want. They do, you know, the, the world. This is like a supreme, the supreme worship of the will, of their own desire to do whatever they like, right? Which is satanic because remember, the, the satanic creed is do what thou will, right? Do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. That is the satanic creed. Do whatever you want. Have no moral limits. Have no, just do whatever your feelings tell you. Do whatever your desire tells you. That's the satanic creed. They also thumb themselves at God. It's completely opposite behavior. It's completely opposite approach, but it's also a rejection of God because they're saying, we don't abide by your moral laws. The body is evil. It doesn't matter what I do. So I'm going to enjoy the, the pleasures of the flesh until I die, and then I'm going to merge with the Godhead. Do you understand the difference between these two? So the one is to deny the good food of the world. God said food is good. In Peter, I think it's in Peter, he says, Jesus says, God says to Peter, was it in John, whatever, you see, he shows that, so these Jews were now followers of Jesus, and the dietary laws, the old Jewish, the Mosaic law, no longer apply to them. And there's a vision that Peter or John has on top of the house where God says, everything that I have made is good, and it is there for you to eat. So that the old Jewish dietary laws no longer apply because they are now free from the law, right? That, that, that era is past, they have a new covenant with God. So the old covenant is passed. They've got the new one. And these people are turning their back on this religious covenant. We will not eat of what God considers good. We will have veggies because screw God. Did that make sense? Yes. Yes. No, now, but yeah. Yeah. Expect... yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, I... yeah. No, I'm, I'm still on maybe. <laughs> yeah, so... So understand that they also believe that, that they believe a whole bunch of weird things, okay? So let me see here. Uh, let me just go back to blah, blah, blah. So there's eight different things that constitute. Um, no, let me just find that list of eight things that, that are generally found across the Gnostic beliefs. Um, okay, so yeah, they are. Um, okay, so in Gnosticism, they believe there are many gods. It's basically pantheistic in a way, right? It's So you've got all of these, these many, many gods, but you have to choose an allegiance to the god that works for you, you see? I, I worship the god of knowledge. No, I worship the god of compassion. I worship the god of parties and lipstick. Do you understand? So you're not bound by any one particular god. Right? You don't owe allegiance to Albert, who has the most light. Gnostics can pledge allegiance to eons that specialize in wisdom, truth, light, repentance, or personalities like the Messiah, Christ, Jesus, Yahweh, Adonai, fill in the blank. That's why you will always find New Ages talking about, I wish you love and light. Right? Because this is the, it's, they take these little aspects and they worship those things. Right? So, which goes against monothe the ideas of monotheism. Okay. But wh why do they choose the eons instead of the monad? Because Albert has no personality. Albert just pops out babies. He's like, <laughs> you understand? <laughs> You're killing me with this Albert. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you said it can also be Cecil. <laughs> yeah, it could be Cecil. We don't. We're not sure. The, the the documentation is vague, but it, we think it's Albert, but it might be Cecil. So it's possible. You know, the poor monad. But the monad is like the little queen of the bees, right? Just pops out babies. That's all it does. Because he's unknowable, right? We cannot say or know anything about him. Yeah. So he just generates babies. He just keeps on making more, just pops things out. That's all he does. But it's all spiritual babies, right? There is no physical world. If, yeah. if wisdom didn't ruin the plan, then we would just be all spiritual and one with God. Correct. We would be God. We are gods, you see. 
Yeah. So. I think. Um, can I? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I think they are they are recognizing that there are um, much kinds of people, much kinds of. Um, it's inclusive. It's inclusive of everybody. Yes, it's and and they make it. I I think it's you know why not to do it straight away until the end because they are building a path. It's it's uh, it's a path that uh, that leads all the way to death, but you can go up on the train in any um, in any uh, like. Uh, yeah, yeah, like part of the train. You can go inside every level of where you at. Like there are traps also for us. Okay, um, the ones that are, um, let's say, um, knowledgeable about the the knowledge and things that happen around them and in this world and how things are working. But but we have also they they put in place because they are um, in this knowledge for much time. And this is their way of life um, that, um, yeah, like, you understand what I'm saying? Or No, not really. Just just try to simplify that again. Why, what? I didn't quite understand you. Um, just simplify it. Try, try to... I say, no, I, yeah, I, I'm saying because they know the, the, the complexity of men and women, and they have like a, a goal to bring them to death. So they will do it in any way and in levels because people are different. Yeah, no, look, yeah, it's it's holistic. They are trying whatever way they can. I mean, there's there's no limitation. Um, I mean, I don't know how two guys are going to have babies, right? Because stick them on a desert island, see how many generations they have, like zero, right? Um, oh, so we were talking earlier about Samia. This is from the Encyclopedia of Islam, Volume 9, page 627. Samia, we mentioned this earlier. This is like this word magic. So it's technically it's called letter magic, right? You would know it as conversational hypnosis, right? It's amazing when you see them do it. It's like I've actually seen a couple of guys try it. It's amazing stuff to, to watch them actually do it. The word as a name for certain genre. Sorry? NLP, exactly. NLP. Yeah. That was a very good take. Yeah, I uh, know. I was wondering if someone would get that. Yeah. NLP, correct. A name for certain genres of magic. The Syriac, simia, plural, and means the signs and the letters of the alphabet. See, so the words are used to create magic. The science, illum, was invented in the time of Moses by, and of course here then we're going to start to, and this is supposedly in the same time that Moses lived, we had Hermes Trismegistus. And they speak of the name of Allah and the names of Allah certainly play a large part in Samiya because you need to know the names of the eons, you see, because the eons act as a god of the level and you need to know the name of the eon to have power over him to let him let you pass through to the next highest level. And once you know the name of Allah, see, now everyone says Allah. Allah is actually a title, right? Allah is a title. It's not the name. Like Yahweh has a personal name, right? So you've got Yahweh, the name of God given to Moses, right? Then you've got Allah, which is a title. It's a theonym. It's not an actual name. So who is the name? Who is Allah? What is his name? We don't know. Well, well, there's obviously where it's pagan. But when you go to the Gnostics, when you go to one of the one of the great scholars of Islam that was killed, right, <clears throat> for revealing too much, for saying things he shouldn't, he stated, now Allah is supposed to have 99 names, right? So the compassionate, the merciful, the powerful, but those are not names, those are descriptions. So again, we're not having names, this is a deflection. And Allah is not a name, and Allah's 99 names are not names, they're descriptions of Allah. Allah is a title, right? So, so the La, right? The God. <clears throat> it's a very broad statement, the God, ah, La. However, Allah has a 100th name, a secret name. <clears throat> and according to this one particular scholar of Islam, the secret name of Allah is you. You are Allah. See? Once you are able to separate your soul and enter through the 99 levels and eventually you enter into the throne room of Allah, you merge with Allah, you are Allah. You are God. You become God. So that's the secret name of Allah. 
So they speak of here, there are two quite different branches of magic. It is very widely applied at the present day to what is often called natural magic, but is hypnotism. And the science of the secret powers of the letters is called Samia, so it's bound up with language, hypnotism. So understand where all this comes from? Islam again, for nefarious purposes. Just thought you might find that interesting. Okay? So Ibn Khaldun expresses it is a working of the nafs of the magician. That's the will of the magician, the the will, yeah, the nafs. The mentalist. Yes, on the, on the imagination of his subject, conveying certain ideas and forms, which are then transferred to the senses of the subject and objectify themselves externally. You see? So it's manipulation and control. And they speak of the schoolers of the Sufis who professed to be able to control the material world by means of these letters and names and figures. So understand, it was considered a study for pious Muslims. Do you understand? And the Sufis were aware of the speculative and pantheistic school, were from the speculative and pantheistic school. So understand, you start to learn like what the, Islam is supposed to be monotheistic and now they're saying these guys are pantheistic and they're doing magic and they're not supposed to do magic. And you start to find a lot of weirdness in Islam, a lot of occult, a lot of occult weirdness that's not supposed to be there. So, so yeah, any, um, any thoughts? Um, so yeah, I'll probably start winding down. I think I've kind of, I mean, we've we've done quite a bit. Uh, hopefully, what have you guys taken from this? I uh, think incredible presentation, really, Lloyd. Uh, absolutely amazing. Um, I, I would like for you, if you are willing, uh, to try to articulate in in one minute uh, the dangers of New Age, uh, because many people who are you know starting to ask questions are falling to New Age, and obviously you made the connection between Gnosticism to New Age and all the rest of the things. But maybe you can just articulate it in one package: the dangers of New Age. So I can just you know. Oh man, I had something like that in one of my talks. Um, actually, no. Let me do. Hold on. Let me see if I have anything on the New Age. We just see the slide fifty something. I may have something. No, okay. I've got nothing on the New Age here. But let me let me just um. Uh, let me talk about. Okay, hold on. You know, let me wind down with a few things because on the New Age, it's remember it's thinking that's not grounded in logos. I mean. God is Logos, which means God is real. So the world is good. God, if he made the world and the world is rational, the world is con pre predictable, or the world is that things are consistent, then God is consistent. God is rational. God is logical. The word, the Logos means the word, and, and, and therefore words must be rational. Words must have consistent meaning. So the word is powerful, and they are corrupting the word. So these are, and sophists, these are sophists. They are corruptors of the word. They are destroyers of the word because we communicate using the word, right? So they can make words mean anything. You've just shown it with twinkle, twinkle, little star and myriad, a little lamb, right? How they can corrupt anything. And um, so the new age is simply a way of freeing yourself from God. It's anything but God. So you view yourself, you view the outside spirits. It's the monad. It's, it's Gnosticism. I don't, I don't think that's a great answer that I've given. I've got some notes somewhere else where I spoke about the new age, but it's really just, it's, Gnosticism is when when you there's one so, famous Gnostic on the internet and he talks about Gnosticism is freedom. It's freedom. It's freedom to make one plus one equal seven. It's freedom to from what to do what. It's 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 chaos really, and it's satanic so it's like, at the end of the day. Free, free yourself from the restraints of reality. Yes, correct, correct. Okay, uh, can can you speak a little bit about um, the uh, the God in Islam, uh, which is pure will? Um, yeah, so God is Logos. Yeah. So God is Logos, right? We know this. God is Logos, but Allah is will. So for instance, God cannot do contradictory. So, so let me, let me, maybe I can come back another time and talk about some of these other things, but this one slide I should do. So God is Logos. That means God is logic. Now, Aristotle developed the laws of logic, and then this was eventually taken on by the Catholics. Thomas Aquinas and even the Jews within the yeshivas, they, if you look at the structure of the Talmud, the way that it, 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 it attacked this whole process of pilpul, of peppering, with taking an idea and attacking it from all sides and then trying to find what is logical, what is rational. This doesn't also mean, though, that, that there isn't an element of sophistry within there because they were lawyers and they could also twist words to their benefit. And um, But that said, <clears throat> Allah is will. 
Now, it is blasphemous to say that Allah cannot do everything, because Allah can do everything, even evil, even contradictories, whereas the God of the Bible cannot do evil, does not do evil, does not do contradictories, because his will is perfectly good, his will is perfectly logical, right? perfectly rational. He's the ultimate principle of rationality and the ultimate principle of good. Therefore, evil and irrationality are not part of his nature, but Allah can do evil. Allah can do the irrational. Allah does. We don't need Satan because Allah can do Satan's will because Allah is greater than everything else. Allah can do greater evil than Satan. Allah is smarter than Satan. Allah is better in every single way. So to say that Allah cannot do everything is to limit Allah. There are no limits on Allah. Therefore, this will becomes satanic. Right, and also, as you know, in in the Quran, Allah is a deceiver. He's a makkar. Allah is the greatest of deceivers, and Allah created a deception. For instance, that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Jesus tricked, used magic to trick someone else, and that person pretended to be Jesus with his mask, with the, with, the, with the mask of his face on this person. So he tricked someone else, and everyone else thought it was Jesus. Jesus escaped and was laughing. And this person was killed, and so Allah can deceive, Allah can trick people. So this is a completely different concept of God. Does that does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, and another thing, um, I, I heard Muslims explaining to me that basically Islam uh, preceded uh, Judaism and um, and Christianity. That it's the first actually religion, and I don't understand the logic in that. Adam was a Muslim, right? So Adam was a Muslim. And obviously, then he must have spoken Arabic, but there's no evidence for that. But don't confuse yourself with the facts now, okay? Very important. Just repeat after me. Don't confuse me with the facts. So Adam was a Muslim, and Adam was 90 feet tall, or Adam was 36 meters tall. Adam is buried next to the Kaaba, right? So we've got a 96, 90 foot tall Adam buried next to the Kaaba in Mecca. So at any time, the Muslims can dig up the skeleton and show it to us, right? Uh, well, what is this toilet like, uh, Kaaba uh, place? Uh, the what? I mean, the toilet. Um, it looks like a big toilet. Uh, the Kaaba. I mean, the, yeah, so the Kaaba. the Kaaba was. So it's a twelve-meter tall building, with because it's sitting on top of a rock. Okay, you got to go up some stairs to get in there, but it's a short building. It's a it's a museum for ants built by a by a thirty six meter tall man, so Adam used to worship there. But how he got in there, Heck alone knows, because he's thirty six meters tall and the Kaaba is like, is a third of his height at best. So no, but seriously, what what is the importance from a, an Islamic perspective to to this? The Kaaba was built. I, I think you showed me pictures, images from the early twentieth century of or something, and it looked like really a secondary toilet place or something. Yeah, I know. So the Kaaba is the very first temple built on Earth in Mecca. Abraham took Hagar there when Sarah told her to go away. And Ishmael and Hagar were taken there by Abraham and they walked 1,000 plus kilometers. They walked there through the desert and there the Kaaba, the world's oldest, was found and Abraham repaired it, you see. However, there was no Kaaba, so Abraham and Ishmael built it, you see. Abraham built the Kaaba as worship to Allah and therefore, only a last statue was there. But what happened is <clears throat> there were 300 statues of different gods in the Kaaba. And Abraham had to throw them all out and leave only the statue of Allah there. See, so the true story. You're not and when, with the and, story about Haran? And when Hagar got there, there was nothing there. And she was going to die because she was alone with, 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 with Ishmael. And she was going to die. And then the angel came and dug a little hole with its wing, and then they found water. And then, because there was nothing there, but Mecca is the world's oldest city. It is the oldest city on the face of the planet. And she was literally in the middle of Mecca, but there was nothing there but sand. And she was going to die with her back against a rock, and the boy was going to die. And then an angel, and then the boy kicked the, his heel, kicked the ground, and a spring came up. And a bird was, and then later on, there was nothing there because they're in the world's oldest city that has been around since the time of Abraham and since the time of the matriarchs and the patriarchs and everybody. And so they're sitting in the middle of the oldest city in the world, and there's nothing there except desert and sand and sun. 
and they were dying of thirst. There was nowhere to go. And she sat down and cried. And then a bird came along and pecked a hole in the ground and then water rushed out and they found water. And then, of course, they're sitting in the middle of the world. All this- yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hang on, I'm not done telling the story yet. Right? And then she ran on top of her and then she comes to this place and she can find no water because there's nothing there in the world's oldest city. And then she runs on top of a mountain and she looks and she can see nothing. She runs down to the next mountain and she looks back to the other mountain and sees nothing because she's in the world's oldest city. And then what happens is an angel comes along and points to her. Do you understand? And Abraham took them there on the Burak because how could they go for a thousand kilometers, her and a little boy? Because Abraham took them there on the Burak. And then Abraham went back and that's how Abraham used to visit them doing day trips on the Burak. But of course, she walked there, right? And she walked there with Abraham, but when she got there, she was alone. And then Abraham and the boy built the Kaaba, but Abraham and the boy repaired the Kaaba. Abraham and the boy put Allah's statue in the Kaaba, but Abraham and the boy, Abraham had to remove the 300 other statues that he found in the Kaaba that he repaired and built. Does that make sense? <laughs> this is the Islamic story. I kid you not. What what is the name the name of the place, Lloyd? Kaaba. The Kaaba, the the big the big yeah. place where all the Muslims go and walk around it. No, when 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 you say when you said when you said it, it's like uh, there's a a short name for a god in Hebrew that sounds oh. like. Sorry, no, but I'm not sure what you mean. The Kaaba. The Kaaba, yeah. Maza Kaaba. No, the Kaaba. Kaaba. No, the Kaaba. The Muslim religious place. What does it have to do with Judaism? A Kaaba, a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Ma Ah, tell me. Right. Is uh, uh, actually Doron should explain it better. Uh, explain to him. When you say a Kaaba in in Hebrew, a Kaaba. Kaaba. Yes, a Kaaba. So it means uh, it's uh, in relation to God, our God. Oh, yes. What? Anagram. Anagram. An anagram. Yeah. Do, do you have the, the picture, the image of the old car? Uh, you know, b- before they covered it with this black, uh, whatever it is? Um. How simple it is. Yeah, I hope so. Let me, okay. <laughs> it looks like a box of, uh, uh, like a black box in an airplane. The where, where where the it is. No, what know, is the, that? The, the black box I'm speaking. I'm this is the, yeah, this is the, uh, the black stone. That they worship. So it's in the one corner of the Kaaba. So this, as you can see, this is the world's oldest building, just so you know. This is the oldest temple in the world, built by Abraham. When he got, so actually, no, no, it was, it, it was found by him because Adam built it. And so Adam, the first man built it. But when Abraham and Hagar got there, there was nothing there. So Abraham built it. But when he and no, no, when he and the boy got again. there, they repaired it. But when she got there alone without Abraham, there was nothing there. But whatever the, f- do, you, do you understand how that story makes absolutely no sense? Yeah, there is not one version of that story. There's like a dozen versions of that story. It's laughably it stupid. Have a doll? Oh, this is a movie set. Yeah, this is a movie set. I'll show you now. Yeah, this apparently is a movie set. So don't don't take this seriously. Um, but. This is the old Kaaba here. This is Mecca before. There was nothing going on in this place. It does have a door. Um, so it was built by a 36 meter tall man who's buried next to it. Okay. I've got some notes on it somewhere. I do have. Oh, so this is the, what does this look like? Just, just well, off the top of your head. What does this look like? Toilet. Say so what? Looks like a lingam. <laughs> she gets it. Lingam what, what? Now, right? what is a lingam? Um, 
it's like uh, from the Hinduism, it's like uh, the sacred uh, feminine and uh, female sa female pots, okay? Yeah, oh, okay. also <laughs> the JJ, the JJ. Yeah. Ah, that's why that's the man before in the image was licking it. Yes, it's the JJ. It's a fertility symbol. My God, you understand? But but how 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 can the woman be? Ah, here like... is the penis. So, yeah. okay, so there, there you've got these pillars. Look, it definitely takes something from... Okay, so here's the story. So let, let me try and give you the... It's been a long time since I read these notes. I don't have them in front of me. But so the story is Allah... So according to the Sufis, Allah has a secret identity. Externally, Allah... Okay, hold on. Let's start here. Okay, so... Okay, what color... Is Allah wearing? Black. Black. Well done to that man. Hold on. Let me just get something up here. I need to. Why is this taking so long? Come on. Okay. Having a slight problem. So let me just go here. Okay. Um, I'm going to go Saudi Arabia, men and women. So let me just do this quickly. Okay. So this is men and women in Saudi Arabia. Okay, let's have a look at this Pikachu, right? What is what color does the man wear? White. And the woman wears? Black. Black. What White. color is Allah wearing? Black. Okay, Allah's wearing black. Okay, so why? So ask yourself this. Uh actually, so let's so ask yourself the question. Why is Allah wearing, actually, no, even worse, let's actually just go here. Why is Allah wearing one of these? Ask yourself, why is Allah wearing one of these? Okay, so I'm going to go for an iqab with golden lining. So, okay, so Allah has one of these with this golden sort of symbol, blah, blah, blah on it. So notice this this is a woman's dress. Allah is wearing black. Why is Allah wearing black when Allah is a man? Ask yourself that question. Ever noticed? Oh. Transgender. So Allah wears black. Okay. So the Kaaba is wearing black. It's wearing a niqab. It's wearing a female dress. Because according to the Sufis, at its core, Allah is feminine. Externally, Allah presents as male, but internally, the secret core of Allah is female. Allah is the Laylat. Say that on themselves in their scriptures that Allah is the. Lady. I've read that within the Sufi material, so you can see here they've got the whole filigree and all that nonsense. But the, the women have it around the 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 hems and stuff. You'll find it in if you go to the Middle East. You know, you'll find that women wear the stuff. Here it is as well, been cleaned up a little bit. So, understand, it's dressed like a female. And, um, yep, yeah, so basically, according to the Sufis, Allah is a woman. Secretly, Allah is a woman. It's female. Um, can you do the three laws of the non-contradictory logic before you leave? Yeah, because yeah. I'm not going to do a whole lot today. I'll, I'll end here. It's been a couple of hours. But see, man is not woman. Dog is not cat. Wet is not dry. So there are three pillars of non-contradictory logic. The first one is the law of identity, which is why we have identity politics. and It's an attack on the first law of logic. Each thing is what it is with a unique identity. A thing cannot be both itself and something else at the same time and in the same way. If A is a cat, then A cannot simultaneously be a dog, right? This means that there's, there are categories, distinct categories, separation between things. But now we're being told men can be women. That's identity politics. Men can be women. Man can be a woman. Woman can be a man. Men can have babies. That's an attack on that, right? Law of non-contradiction. A statement cannot be both true and false at the same time and in the same respect. It means that contradictory claims cannot both be true. It is not possible for a tree to exist and not to exist at the same time. Then you have the law of the excluded middle. 
Any given statement must be true or false with no middle ground or third option. There is no alternative. For example, a coin toss will result either in heads or in tails. There is no third possibility. For instance, you can be pregnant or not pregnant. You can't be a little bit pregnant, but not really kind of not pregnant. You are or you are not. See, they cannot be both. So that, that's how these laws of logic work. Now, we often witness the violations of these laws. So instead of acknowledging contradictions, they downplay and they merge contradictions under the labels of, well, you know, it's, it's rather complex and it's a very nuanced situation. The moment you hear the words complex or nuanced, especially the word nuanced, start looking out for how you're being lied to through sophistry. So rather than employing the scholastic approach of examining and combining evidence to determine the correct answer, eliminating incorrect answers, they try to make everything valid, everything. And if everything is true, then nothing is true. So, so that's a very simple, that's a very simple um, presentation on these laws. I've got longer, more detailed ones on this, but uh, hopefully that will suffice. It brings a point that I just read yesterday about fascism and Peronism in the Argentina and so on. They call themselves the third way. And you just uh, ex explained there is no excluded middle. Yeah. And so, fascism came out from socialism. Marxism. Well, I mean, he was a hardcore, he was a hardcore um, socialist, but he developed, I mean, he simply developed a form of socialism that was national patriotic socialism, whereas um, the Nazis had race socialism. Right. They, yeah. they remember they, they were the national socialists. They were against the international socialists because the Russians were international socialists. So they were race socialists based on the Germanic race. The Russians were international socialists and the, and the, um, the fascists were simply a nation based socialism that they were for the Italians. Yeah, but originally, for example, Mussolini was 14 years part of the Socialist Party. Yes. And yeah. they took all this garbage from socialist uh, philosophy. Yeah, of course. It's the same. Look, remember, it's Gnostic. You can make it up as you go. Make up your own thing as you go. It's not, it's not grounded to reality. It's not grounded to logos. So, yeah, guys, I'll call it a night here. I think that's all right. It's been a couple of hours. Hopefully, so it's, it's been educational. Incredible, fantastic. I, I loved it, and I'm sure my friends did, and the viewers later on. And uh, guys, if you have a chat on the phone, you have to do it. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lloyd, I, I'm waiting for the next for time. time. Thank, you, Lloyd. <laughs> Thank you, Lloyd. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you okay. very much, and we will see you next time. And I will send you uh, the recording so you can have it also from, you know. Yeah, outside. I'll stop the recording here and make sure I wait for it to write out. Okay, so good night, guys. Take care. All the best Thank out there. Thank you, Thank you. Take care. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.